All right, so we are gathered here today because we've just announced the launch of Ledger Stacks, which is the next step in Ledger's hardware journey. Um, I think it's really important to actually discuss this crypto experience that Ledger Stacks brings and the evolution that it, it comes with from Ledger. Um, but I, I want to do that by starting actually with you. You know, we happen to be two Midwesterners in Paris, further away than most, I would say, or thought we would be. Um, but you've had this career where I'd argue technology is always fueling the evolution of how culture shows up in daily life, from Beastie Boys to Winamp to Beats Music to Apple to LVMH. Technology becomes this distribution for culture. You know, the medium changes, but not the need for technology to change how we use it as we become a more global world with the internet. And so, I'd love to kind of hear a bit more about you、uh, and how you sort of came to be with us today. Well, I, mean, I think I'm just got lucky.、Uh, you know, I was a, I was a kid who loved music, and you know, I guess I guess loved culture because you know. Along with music comes all kinds of other things, from like you know, horror comics to you know, horror movies, <laughs> I guess, and <laughs> skateboarding, and you know, I, I I think you know, one thing that's important in my story is that I was always a lo- lover of niche culture. So I grew up in a small town in Indiana where we didn't even have a record store,、um, yet I loved these things that were impossible to get even when you drove an hour to the record store. So. What I had to do was to, you know, go near Notre Dame, the university, and and buy a copy of Maximum Rock and Roll, and then take it home and mail order to get what I wanted. So, you know, that was in the '80s. So in 1990, '91, when I got to university and I got online, this is pre-web, but you know, there were internet communities then that are really in so many ways no different from from Reddit, Reddit or Discord today.、Um, but that was where I met. People who like the same music as me for the first time, so the internet to me was was really just this this place to kind of get what I wanted,、um, which I wasn't finding around me.、Um, and then I think you know that that led me to a whole bunch of opportunities. I mean, I studied computer science in the early '90s, and it was really very difficult to stay in grad school in, in the mid '90s because there were so many jobs that you could get, you know, outside of outside of the university. Um, you know, but I, I was lucky and just sort of fell into this slipstream of digital music、um, from the from the very beginning、um, when it was science fiction all the way through to the iPhone.、Um, now, what I became inadvertently with that was a student of how the internet is is changing culture,、um, and and I, and I, I suppose more broadly maybe how technology changes culture because you're always looking for patterns and you're. You're looking for, you know, the pattern. You know, first it's like, is this similar to the pattern I saw last year? And then, you know, now, you know, that I'm older, it's okay. How is how is what we're seeing in crypto similar to what we saw、um, in the evolution of the internet? But but then, you know, it, it, it encourages you to read more, and especially being part of the music business. You know, I was always struck by the fact that, you know, we pretended like the music business had been around forever. But really, it had only been around for a few decades.、Um, so we always kind of wanted to go back to when things were better. But but then you gain some perspective and realize, well, wait a minute. You know, none of none of these things are divine. These are all just industries that were you know created by people who came not too long before us. And you know, maybe change is actually the constant.、Um, you know, so I I think that you know that's how that's how I ended up here was you know loving culture, loving music, loving skateboarding. Um, and studying computer science, and then just being lucky enough to put those put those two things together,、um, you know, the way I look at it, you know, we're all crazy in our own way, and and I've been really lucky in that the way that I'm crazy is is valuable to someone, you know, I I, I love culture, I love technology,、um, and you know, I've, I've managed to to sort of put those put those things together and into a career, which, I mean, I never even. Had any aspirations of having a career? To be honest,、um, you know, but、uh, but I but I thankfully I have passions, and you know those passions have have intersected with something that you know has become at least somewhat professional. I mean, we've we've kind of joked before about you know like you don't believe in religion, but you do believe in music, and maybe you just actually are a product of scarcity, right? Like within music, there are genres, and people could call some genres niche or small, but 
that actually could still be millions of people that are excited by a topic or by by an item. And so it's almost as if your career has brought you to respect and understand that the amalgamation of things that are deemed small is actually larger than the sum of parts that most people recognize. And so therefore, you're sort of primed to understand and adopt what could a digital asset be, right? Like, how could you take music and go from the way you think about the collection of music to the introduction of digital assets? I think there's definitely something something to that. I think I've been super lucky in that, you know, if I was somebody who, um, you know, loved mass culture, I think the internet would have been like, you know, totally scary, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I knew a lot of those people, you know, as, as the music business was going from a $30 billion industry to a $15 billion industry, they just wanted it to go back to the days of, you know, the Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears. And, and that was never my goal. You know, my goal was, was not... Um, you know, my, my goal was, was actually to, you know, have people who love things that are niche, um, have a more perfect marketplace in a way. And I, and I, I think there is something really interesting in, in, in what you're saying about scarcity being some sort of inadvertent theme, because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've always said that, you know, I remember when I saw Steve Caballero, who's a skateboarder, wear a Misfits t-shirt. I think it took me two years after that to find an actual Misfits album you know, and, and not for lack of looking, you know, so, but I think it's hard to imagine those days, right. When, when the, the entire world isn't at your fingertips, when you didn't like just ask a question and immediately pick up your phone and type it into Google or YouTube or whatever and find the answer, right. You know, you actually had to go record store to record store asking people, you know, for these sorts of things now come all the way full circle on discogs.com. Oh, and by the way, you know, the misfits were a very unpopular band. That's why they were so hard to find. They were not a, uh, you know, a mass, uh, a mass market product by any, by any means in the eighties. Um, which is also, but you know, now I was in Las Vegas a few weeks ago and I saw the misfits skull on the sunset strip because I think they were playing a Halloween show at, at, a, at some casino. And, um, a couple of years ago on Discogs, the most expensive album sold that year was a Misfits seven inch that had sold for more than $10,000. Right. So that, that, that notion of, you know, I, I, again, the, the way that I frame, you know, what, what I've lived through is the internet is this revolution of information, you know, where information went from being locked behind gatekeepers, whether that was FM radio or cable television or m newspapers or magazine companies, there were, there were media gatekeepers. And unless you owned some spectrum, you didn't get access to talk to people, right? You know, to that being completely unlocked. Like that's what the internet did fundamentally. Anyone can go register a domain and go, I can be as big as Yahoo, right? That would, that, that's what the, the, what the internet, you know, was all about. Now I think that we're into a separate revolution and that's a revolution of value. And I think you're right. There's something about that combination of, you know, growing up wanting, you know, scarce information for scarce goods that like sort of puts you in a position to understand, um, you know, first a revolution of information, which ultimately, ultimately leads to 6.5 billion smartphones on the planet, right? So you have 6.5 billion people who have, you know, powerful computers with high speed internet connections in their pockets. And that creates like this, you know, this network of connectivity where, where information can travel, but also value can travel. Right. And, and I think that's, that's where we've landed, you know, we're, we're now, and I, I, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, certainly during the pandemic, but, but even a bit before I started to realize that we were spending a lot of our time and attention in these borderless online worlds Yet we are, you know, voting for our governments in these, you know, sort of fundamentally geographic, um, you know, political regimes, right? So the, the idea of democracy is you, you draw a line around some people on the earth and then you get the people, you know, inside of that circle uh, or whatever shape it is to elect somebody who represents their ideals. And, you know, I started to realize that, you know, A, that was increasingly difficult, um, you know, and go back to... Elkhart County, Indiana, which is, you know, as richer, rich and poorer, poor and, and more diversity ethnically than it did when I was growing up. Um, but also you, we live, we spend our time and attention in these parallel universes in this, in this borderless world, the one you and I are in right now, the one we're talking in right now, we're not in the same physical location yet. We are collaborating. Um, and you know, of course those worlds are going to have their own 
economies, right? So we'll, we'll have not only the ability to, you know, to interact in the way that we're doing right now, um, you know, over TCP IP, but we're also going to have the ability to transfer value uh, over this. And, and that, that will be outside of, um, you know, kind of the government system. It'll be, it'll be a, 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 digital, a digital system. I think you're hitting on a really important point there because the revolution of information came about. And before that, everything that you learned that you knew as true that you discovered was completely told to you, right? Experimentation and exploration was a small fracture of what you could actually expect from life. And then when you actually got the internet, we had to adapt to it and therefore hardware had to adapt to it, which meant that the utility adapted around it as well. And suddenly individuals had the ability to have a different form of information than someone sitting next to you, right? You could look at your feed and see a completely different world around you than I could in mine. And so we have this fracture, which you've talked a lot about in, cert in sort of how we see ourselves as tribes. And I think it's important to explain that a little bit because it's also important to explain, well, like what could value mean? Like to your point, in a borderless world, it could mean that, you know, we are interested in a DAO or an NFT project that gives us value over something that we find interesting, but it could also mean in the future that the way that we tie the value of our identity and our history is also separate from that physical place because now we've revolutionized information. And so therefore in this next phase, like how should, how should someone listening actually contextualize that today? I see an evolution that starts with Bitcoin and, and digital money and evolves to digital collectibles. And then I would say digital utilities such as tickets and memberships. And then I would say digital products like that digital replacement for the wristwatch. And then ultimately we have digital passports, right? I mean, ultimately your government document is a, um, it's a, it's a digital document. And the way that you move borders is you prove that you are the owner of the wallet that contains that document. And, and not only that, um, but, you know, you, you can kind of federate um, the access to the information that's within that document, right? If you are, you know, 22 years old and you go to a bar in Los Angeles, they take your driver's license from you and they run it through a little machine, um, you know, which, which pulls way too much information about you personally, more information than it needs to. The only thing you need to do is prove that you are of age to get into that club. They don't need your personal information. And that's the kind of thing you'll be able to do with digital identity in the future. Um, and I think these things are, are inevitable. Um, but if we live in a world where digital assets are an important part of our life, then we must have digital security, right? Because if, 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 my, if, if my wealth, if my individuality, if my belongings and ultimately my identity are represented by scarce digital goods, right? If the future of identity is ownership, then I must have security around that ownership and I can't have hacks at scale. By the way, the, the present of identity is ownership. You know, I, during, during COVID, I could go to the U S and I could come back to Paris, unlike many, many, many people, because I owned two pieces of identification. I had a U.S. passport and I had a French, uh, a French work permit, right? And those two, the ownership of those two documents allowed me to move those borders. Now, you know, the technology behind those two documents was not great on a relative basis. Um, and in the future will be better. And I think you just very clearly described the different types of value that we should be looking at as we think about this mind shift, right? Because it's not actually behavior shift. The behavior shift is already there. It's the technology catching up. And so before we kind of go into this next piece, I think you bring back the really important aspect of why hardware matters in this and why hardware matters around the security of these types of value. So as we start to go into ledger stacks and what this brings to this revolution of value, can you describe stacks a little bit for those who are listening and don't know about it yet? Sure. And actually, let me, let me just um, pause on like why hardware matters, you know, in, in technology, there's no such thing as software without hardware. Right. So, you know, I think in oftentimes in, in, um, in crypto, we, we talk about like hardware wallets versus software wallets. But the fact is, is software wallets run on hardware. So we should really like just focus on the hardware that those software wallets run on. And, and the reality is, is that if you don't have a secure element and you don't have a secure display, then you don't have security. 
period. So it's not about software wallet versus hardware wallet. It's about the, it's about the you know, I mean, look, your phone ru- is running an operating system and your ledger is running an operating system. You know, the question is, you know, do you have security within all of these elements, within, you know, the, the, within the chip, within, you know, the path from the chip to the, to the inputs and outputs, and then inside of the operating system um, that this is running on, do you have security? Um, that's really the, the, the question to be asked. Um, so, you know, for, for Ledger, the, the focus has always been security and self-custody and, and security has always been by design, right? The assumption is, is that, um, everything that can be hacked will be hacked. Um, and that, that, you know, reward, um, dictates how much someone is willing to spend on an attack, right? So if you have a centralized resource that's, that's hosting, you know, billions in assets, then you can afford to spend a lot to exploit that resource, right? So you're always looking for by design and, and you're looking, so you're looking for, um, you know, ways that, that, um, you know, that you can, first of all, decentralize so that if, if one node in the network is attacked, it doesn't, you know, attack everyone, uh, in the network. And also you're, you're looking for that resiliency, um, to be, you know, to be part, to be anticipated, you know, upfront, right? Assume that the attack is coming. You know, you can't put a door behind 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 a door and just say that's secure because it's going to be very hard to get through. Because if there's enough, if the prize behind all of those doors is big enough, someone will get through all the doors. So you have to ask, you know, what are the other ways that you can mitigate an attack? And in the case of crypto, it, it's actually beautiful because your value is secured by the network, right? And and that's that is the beauty of the blockchain. So you know, you go, okay, well, great. I don't have to protect my value. I do have to protect, um, you know, my key, which shows I am the owner of that value. Okay, well, we've already massively simplified the you know the, the challenge, right? Because I don't have to protect all the gold bars. I just have to protect the proof that, that those gold bars are mine. I can assume the gold bars are safe, but I have to, I have to protect the proof that I am the owner of, of many of those gold bars. So, you know, the design of Ledger has always been in this way, right? How can you um, do two main and, and incredibly crucial things? Um, one, protect your private keys from, from being exposed or, or, or stolen. And two, how do I know that when I'm signing a transaction, I know what it is I'm signing? Knowing that to do that, you must have a secure display, a secure display that your computer and your phone don't have. So again, this isn't about hardware versus software because your computer and your phone are hardware, right? This is about, you know, about doing crucial things, um, you know, with a secure display and about keeping crucial assets, namely your private keys offline. So this is what Ledger's been doing for seven years, and it started with the with the Nano S, um, Nano X, which added Bluetooth. Um, now Nano S Plus, which is you know basically uh, the X minus the Bluetooth. So we we um, basically took the same architecture as the X, the same chip as the X, with one added benefit um, that it's that it's got a developer, uh, a better, and more developer friendly features the same screen as the X. So the S plus is really this, you know, fantastic device, which for $80 gives you the world's best security. But I would say that the X and the S have one big shortfall. And, and that is, you know, the screen is small and, and there's another, which is, you know, not fatal, but maybe unfortunate, I would say. And that is that they have the, the form factor of a USB stick, which is quite convenient. I am known for wearing mine around my neck and it, you know, works, it, it works very well. Me but too. the problem is, is that there's this mental hurdle that people have to get, get over with crypto, which is, and what they think is, oh, USB stick. I know what that is. You put stuff in it. So that must be the place where I put my digital value. Then it sort of becomes this blocker for people understanding how crypto works because they think, oh, my crypto lives in that device. And then they think, oh my God, if I lose that device, I'm screwed. And now they've got, just got the wrong mental model for the whole thing which is, you know, no, your, your crypto is not in that device. This is a device which keeps your private keys offline and shows you what you see is what you sign at the moment of signing, but actually your value is safe on the blockchain. But, you know, so you know, I, I think that, you know, the form factor of the S and the X are great. I love them. 
I wear, again, I wear them around my neck. I loved seeing it around Gunna's neck on the Met Ball. All, all credit to Ari on that one. It's another story we can tell another time. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the really like that people want a bigger screen and a better form factor. Right. But you hit on an important note that I think before we move on, we should just reemphasize for people, which is that the network itself is secure. The hardware is not. And to your point, software is built on hardware. So if you have hardware that is inherently insecure, you moving to this new space, all of your value, it will never be okay unless you actually choose secure hardware. And because we come from an era where infrastructure was built on top of banking systems, which were centralized, most people have never had to think about that before. So in order to engage in the distributed network where your digital life has value and you deserve to own that value, you have to understand hardware. And this is the first time I would say Ledger's had. I mean, the, the Ledger devices are beautiful, but now we have a sexy device. The, it's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the revelation that I had that led me to be here at um, Ledger today was back in 2018. And I was lucky that I was personal friends with Pascal Gauthier so that I was able to sort of think hard enough about this to have this revelation. Because what we're talking about right now is the thing that hit me like a ton of bricks in 2018 when I went, oh my God, like this company actually could be one of the big important companies of the next 20 years. And, and my, my thinking was, wow, digital assets are going to be this revolution. And it's a revolution that's akin to the internet. And it's actually separate from the internet. You know? So I, I really don't like the term Web3 because it makes, it makes it seem like it's incremental to Web2, but it's not. You know, it, it's like if you think about the technological revolutions of the last couple hundred years, you know, from industrialization to automotive to the silicon chip, certainly the internet... And I believe that, you know, digital assets are, are a revolution that is on par with each of those. It's not a part of the internet revolution. It's actually its own separate revolution. Um, okay. So, and I think that the, the net result of that, as we, as we just talked about is, is that, you know, we, the digital assets play an important and kind of in, inextricable role in our lives. I mean, I think this is another thing that people really have a hard time with. You know, we like to think that we're these sovereign creatures and technology is this thing and we're in control of it. It's not true, right? The fact that your water treatment, your local water treatment facility probably runs on Windows 95 puts you and your family at risk, right? You know, like we, we can't separate ourselves from technology, you know, and you experience that all the time just by the, the hassle of like dealing with, you know, your phone company or whatever it is you, you have to deal with. And, and, you know, you realize that actually unplugging, you know, is incredibly difficult. And I think that this also just defies people's logic in so many ways. I mean, I think I remember in 2000 when people thought, uh, the dot com thing is over, you know, and, and the internet's for geeks and this is never going to be a big part of life. Like, but now like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like the, the people who are hustling are the people who use the internet the most, right? I mean, if you are, you know, if you're riding a bike for Deliveroo here in Paris, you know, you're not a wealthy person. Um, and you, you need your cell phone more than almost anyone else in the city, right? Um, so this isn't, the, you know, technology isn't something that is just a luxury, right? It's not, it is, it is a necessity for, um, you know, for, for existing in, a, in, in the society that, that, that we've built. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but, you know, but, but I don't think you can deny it. And I think people really try to. They have a discomfort with it. They, um, they reject it and they deny it and it keeps them from seeing how new technologies will also become this inextricable part of, of our lives. I mean, you know, I, I suppose you could file your taxes in the U.S. if you didn't have an internet connection, but I, I think that it would be a lot harder than, you know, if you did. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, the technology becomes, you know, the way you make an appointment at the doctor, the way you make an appointment at the department of motor vehicles. Like this isn't like some fringe, uh, you know, um, thing. I, I think, I think so. So, you know, now when you think about, okay, digital assets are going to become that embedded in our lives, right? They're going to become that important to us. Okay. That was where I went, hold on a second. If that's the case, then the devices that we are using today are not the devices of the future, period, period, right? 
And now, like, look back again, people think like, oh, you know, I, I, by, by the way, I remember people thinking, oh, no one will ever unseat MySpace, <laughs> right? Or, you know, and, and, oh, Facebook is unassailable, right? Now, kids will tell you Facebook is for grandparents. They've never heard of MySpace, right? These things have a way of going away. So if, you know, in 2002, I would have told you that, you know, the future kind of mobile revolution was going to be driven by the people who just made this mp3 player that came on the market you would have laughed at me and you would have said come on Ian. like microsoft obviously has this on lock or maybe nokia right um you know you never would have you know you you people forget like you know memory is fiction right so there are very few people who either remember or would admit that um, they that that they doubted Apple in 2002, but it was a ten dollar stock. They had less than two dollars, less than two percent market share. Um, you know, but there was this path from the iPod to the iPhone that was revolutionary, and Microsoft trying to condense a personal computer and Windows into a phone was a massive failure. And I, I you know, I think you would have been hard pressed to find the people that would have picked the right horse in that race. So, so this is the context for me when I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think digital assets are a huge part of the future of humanity. Um, I think that it's not even a, an opinion. It's a fact. The, the devices that we have on our desks and in our pockets cannot protect digital assets, period. Right? So, okay, now which horse are you going to bet on? Are you going to bet on, you know, a, 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 um, a secure device that has to become more full featured um, to become that secure digital asset device of the future, or are you going to bet on you know the the the, the massive um, it does absolutely everything device somehow becoming more secure? You know, I mean, so that's you know that that's that's I think you know the the importance. Right? I still haven't gotten to stacks or the beauty of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, th I think it's important to double click on that fact that you know. If, if memory is sort of this failure, the reality too is humans don't like to go backwards. And so to your point, like Ledger isn't here to decide what's good or bad. There is just an undeniable reality of what's coming and what exists around us. And as secure hardware with this uncompromising security, you actually made the bet to focus on ease of use, right? More people will do this. And so therefore, how do we make it easier? Because to your point, prohibitive language a tough device, something that looks weird, something that makes you feel like it intuitively isn't doing what the device actually serves the purpose of, that's hard for people to absorb. So I think that is a really good way to think about like, okay, but what does stacks change in this process? Yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a great, a great transition. Um, so again, 2018 was when I had that realization, but I didn't come to, to Ledger until 2021. Um, and when I did come to Ledger, Pascal gave me the title of chief experience officer, his idea, not mine, by the way. Um, and, and so when he said it, I had to go, Oh, okay, wait, is that, is that really a title? What does that mean? Um, but it was, it's, it was such a, a brilliant premonition in, in my view and a real challenge for me by the way, it's not Why? a title I've, I've had in the past. Um, but you know, basically what he was saying was Ian, when you buy a piece of Apple hardware, you're not buying a piece of Apple hardware. You're buying the Apple experience. You're buying into the Apple experience. You're buying into the Apple ecosystem is what you're doing. You know, you're buying into a world of blue bubbles, not green bubbles, right? That's what you're doing when you, when you, um, are buy that piece of Apple hardware. And, you know, Pascal recognized that, you know, he has, you know, the right direction in terms of, you know, the North star for the company, security, self-custody, digital assets, these, you know, this is a gigantic opportunity, but if we're going to be the ones, you know, who build this, if we're going to be the Apple of this space and not the Blackberry or Nokia of this space, it has to be an experience and not just a piece of hardware, not just a piece of technology. Um, and so then you go, okay, well, you know, how do we do that? Where are, where are the, you know, where are the real the real challenges here. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also what are the ones that you, you break off first, right? Because you can't solve everything, uh, at once from a, from a challenge perspective. Okay. So with, uh, from, from our perspective, um, you know, we're looking at, okay, where are the experience challenges? I think, you know, and many people will tell you like, Oh, web three is hard to use, but you know, I always say, wait, stop. What do you mean specifically? Right? Because 
oftentimes people just don't know. They're just repeating what someone else said. Um, but really, I think there are two very key challenges in, in kind of usability for the, a new person coming into the space. One is onboarding. And onboarding is a challenge not only because you've got to set, if you really want to do it right, you have to set up a device um, and you have to write down these 24 words, um, you know, and, and that takes time. So there's a user experience issue there, but there's also just a conceptual and mental load issue there. I mean, if, if, if writing down and securely storing your 24 words doesn't freak you out, you don't understand it. Right. And so getting people over that initial mental hurdle of what self custody is and means is, is I think step one. And, and that's something we're working on every day. So with stacks, we've massively improved the onboarding, um, user interface itself. I've done it with stacks, um, many, many, many times now, both a new device and a restored device. And I, I'm, I, I love how much easier it is than what we've experienced in the past. You know, I can get through the, the initial onboarding in 60 seconds. And I think, you know, two minutes to do, to do a restore, um, which is, you know, which is a huge step up. It doesn't solve the mental hurdle necessarily, right. Or the cognitive load, but you know, ease of use wise, that's much better. And we have much more coming on that. It's a big focus for us for, for 2023. The second, um, you know, real usability challenge is the connectivity to web three. And that's what we're trying to attack with ledger connect, but also with our partnerships with many people, whether that's, you know, Coinbase wallet, MetaMask, Temple, um, uh, and, you know, or, uh, trust wallet, et cetera, you know, like the, all, all of that really matters, like making, making connectivity to web three, um, super easy to use. And that's why, again, we're trying to set the standard for both security and ease of use with ledger connect at the same time, partnering, uh, with other wallets, um, on, on getting that right now from, a you know, from a look and feel perspective, um, with the device itself, you, you ultimately want to get something that, you know, is something that, that people want and people understand. Um, in the podcast with Tony Fidel, which I, which I really encourage people to, to listen to because he does a much better job explaining why he was thinking about the form factor. Um, but I, I love, I mean, I, I mean, I've learned so, so much from, from Tony just generally in life, in, in work, everything else. Um, but what's amazing to hear him talk about the design of this device is that he was looking for, you know, analogies. He's like, okay, this thing can't look like a USB stick. It also can't look and feel like a phone, but we know we like kind of phone screen form factors. And, um, you know, we know that when we're thinking about value, credit cards make sense to us. There's, a, you know, there's a space in our brain for these little cards of value. Um, and, you know, he, he went all the way to the analogy of this kind of like stack of cash with the, you know, with the band around it. Right. And, 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 and for, I, it's so amazing to hear him say it because you can just see, he put all this stuff in the hopper and out came, you know, ledger stacks, which is, uh, I would have never got there. Like that's why it's so amazing to me, you know, it just so if you see, I can understand the inputs and my output would not have been the same, but you know, his, his brain went there like, you know, kind of automatically. But I think that, that in doing so, you know, what, what he's done with ledger stacks is he's, he's created something that, that does represent exactly what it is we're, we're trying um, to be, which is it's this secure companion to your, you know, existing device, right? So, you know, on one hand you go, oh my God, we're, we're headed toward a future where digital assets are valuable and the devices that we have don't handle digital assets. This must, this is going to be a disaster. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. Well, for, you know, anyone can walk into a Best Buy and for 80 bucks, you know, make the, their $1,200 phone secure. Okay. Well, who wouldn't do that? Right. So I think, you know, with, with Ledger Stacks, what you're doing is you're, you're adding just this, like this form factor that makes a lot of sense to people that's easy to onboard, that's easy to personalize, that makes it something that I want to have in my life that doesn't feel overly geeky, that actually feels like it does what I need it to do, which it is, it adds security to my already digital life. Well, and to your exact point about Pascal sort of giving you this mantle and saying, okay, what are the first pieces of experience that I'm going to go after? You actually said with Tony, I'm going to go after the experience itself. I'm going to give a reason if I can make this URL experience IRL 
to make it sexy and fun and compatible and actually something that, you know, respects this world that only, as your point from earlier, you are the only person that knows your own algorithm. And so now you have this new way to actually show your world to others that nothing else, nothing else describes or displays other than stacks. And that's why I think the, the e-ink is so important as well for, for ledger stacks, because it lets you get to use it, not just something that you have to charge every day, but it's actually meant to serve a real purpose with longevity in your life. So with Ledger, we're trying to build this experience and the experience includes the, the hardware, but then it, it comes all the way through to the way that you use the hardware. So, um, you know, first of all, I'd like to reiterate what Tony said in, in the podcast that, you know, Ledger Stacks is, is a V1, right? And, you know, I, I remember that, that there were, you know, eight, eight versions of the, of the iPod and we're on to iPhone 14 or wherever we are right now. Right. So, you know, with, with ledger stacks, like let's, let's imagine that there's a long, um, roadmap and a, and a long future here, and there'll be many evolutions. Also remember that when the iPod came out, um, you know, there was no iTunes for windows and windows was 98% of the market. There was no, um, there was no iTunes store. There was no iTunes video. There was, you know, there was so much yet to come. And I think again, our memories, um, you know, forget that. And we, we, we imagine, you know, sort of the iPod as it was five years in, as opposed to the way it was day one. So again, let's make that leap and say that ledger stacks is, is that V one. And there's, and there's a lot of, of, of evolution to come and imagine what that is. This is also why, you know, the operating system is so important, right? Because, you know, I think what you do in hardware is you make hardware, um, you, you make uh, an operating system so that people can build on it. That builds an ecosystem. So that builds an ecosystem of services and applications that grows the market. And now you've got a, now you've got a bigger audience and you've got to rev the hardware. You have to have that, that, um, operating system that, that built, you know, where, so people can build on top of it that grows, um, you know, applications and services that grows the market. And now you do it all again. So that's sort of, you know, I see it as not, not just a, a flywheel and not just a circle, but really a spiral because, you know, it's getting bigger and bigger, um, you know, as it, as it grows, but you do keep needing to refresh the hardware, um, continue to, to, um, to develop the operating system, continue to develop the ecosystem of, you know, of, of people that are developing on that, including yourselves. So, you know, we're not the only ones developing, uh, on that. It's, you know, it takes, it takes a village, uh, you know, and, and, and much more than that. And then that's what grows. And then, and then you, that's what, and then you, then you keep going, um, you know, from that point. So I think that, that that's the important thing to consider here is that, um, you know, there is this sort of, um, this ecosystem around the hardware, uh, that, that's, that's incredibly important. So from our perspective, you know, when, when we're looking at it, um, you know, again, th think about iTunes relative to the iPod, think about the Nest app relative to the Nest device, you know, without the, without the software component of it, the device can't succeed. And that, and that's the part that I really want, want, um, to emphasize, because we spend a lot of time talking about ledger stacks. We talk about this beautiful screen. We talk about the e-ink incredible right now, ledger live ledger connect. These are incredibly important. The fact that you can, um, buy crypto, you know, and have it go, you know, straight to your ledger stacks, uh, or, you know, straight into, uh, you know, you know, self custody protected by ledger, ledger stacks, um, is incredibly important. The fact that I can swap from, you know, a stable coin to Ethereum or Bitcoin, et cetera, and back again, all from self-custody, super important. The fact that I can stake and earn yield all from self-custody, very important. The fact that we're trying to build, um, you know, an ecosystem where you can securely, uh, you know, mint, uh, sell, trade NFTs, you know, incredibly important, right? We've got where we've had, you know, huge amounts of transaction volume on sites like OpenSea thus far, and really no one's ever done it securely, meaning with hardware, with clear signing, you know, that, that's a, that's a huge opportunity, you know, yet to come. And then there are services that we, you know, we need to build on top of this, such as seed phrase backup and recovery to make onboarding, you know, much simpler for people. So, you know, again, yes, Ledger Stacks is, is, is a beautiful device. And I, I think, I hope that it, that it, is the iPod of this space. That's my sincere um, hope. But I think for it to be, it has to have iTunes, right? There has to be 
Ledger Live, Ledger Connect. There also has to be a developer platform, you know, with, with an active, um, you know, developer audience. And then you have to have this array of services around it, um, like what's possible uh, with, with Ledger Live, buy, sell, swap, stake, lend, credit card. Um, you know, you have to have this NFT ecosystem around that is secured by Ledger Connect, that is, um, has best practices driven by things like Ledger Market, et cetera. And then you have to have, you know, services for the customer that don't yet exist, you know, that, that we, that we need to build. Um, so I, I think that, that really to, to understand, you know, fully what it is, you know, not just that we're trying to do, but what really needs to be done for, um, for this space to be successful, you have to look at that. I also think that leads you to sort of why ledger stacks, right? Versus something else, because you go, okay, well, look, first of all, if you don't have a secure display, forget it. And I don't care if it's at your phone, it's your device, anything. If there's not a secure display, it's not secure. Just like stop. There's no, that's not a, that's, that's not a objective argument that I'm willing to have with anybody. Um, you know, and second, you know, you have to have a secure element in certain terms of the, the, the chip inside the device. Um, and third, there better be an operating system, right? Because if there's not an operating system, then there's not an array of services that's going to grow with us and it's going to end up in a place that we couldn't even predict, right? And this is not just about crypto. This is about security. And this is about, you know, secure applications. Um, you know, I, I, I can't wait to use my Ledger Stacks for FIDO2 to have truly secure login, um, you know, to sites across the internet. As an example of something that has zero crypto um, you know, relationship to it, but it is secure. And I do need, um, security, which is beyond what my phone provides, you know, to log into, you know, the most secure pieces of my digital life. Right. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that, that we, we need to be thinking about what is that, you know, entire secure ecosystem around the ledger stacks. Yeah. I mean, I really want to double click on that fact that we truly do just live a life of one of one and actually having your ledger stacks like you can fully actualize that in a way where you can live a one of one and you could have 10 different ones a day right like we were joking at the office for for programming for ledger open which will have just happened when this comes out and someone wrote on their spine for their stacks you know their kid's name and put like college fund you know like that's what that stacks exactly. is for and it's it's really this this playful element and if you know if in the 2000s if in this previous world that already feels so far away the internet brought us this revolution of information, which changed how we connect. It brought us to this place of one of one, right? Like we individually are the scarcity and our experience is that scarcity. And so now it changes how we trade and measure that value forever. And so, you know, if it's happening right now, you know, what 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 should people be aware of as they step into this world as their experience? Like how, how would you, if they've just gotten a ledger stacks, you know, what what do you recommend for them to immerse themselves if they're new? So just somebody who's a newcomer to crypto generally? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to remind, you know, when you said earlier, like we already have over 5 million people who use Ledger devices as they currently stand. And so we're about to have millions more come on board for, for Ledger Stacks, which is creating this new experience. So how does the Ledger experience overall help them as they come into this world? Well, I think, I mean, what we're trying to do is to create, um, you know, a place for them to connect with whichever services are useful and interesting to them. I think for anyone coming into the space, the first thing I'd recommend they do is, is participate in Ledger Quest in some way and familiarize themselves with Ledger Academy. Um, you know, in this space, you know, knowledge is power, period. Um, and, and the, um, you know, it's, it's also, um, you know, it, it protects you, right? I would actually recommend people spend time on education before they come into the space. You know, I mean, even if before you bought a ledger, you spent six months learning, I think you're, you're in a, in a, in a great, you know, in a better place, you know, you're, you want to, you know, I've, I've known people that, you know, that that's actually their first step is I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to buy anything. I'm, I'm going to spend zero money, but I'm, I'm going to deep dive on, on the learning. And, you know, so I'd say that's, you know, that, that's actually a great idea. So, you know, I, I would first start with learning. That's why we have Ledger Academy. That's why we have Ledger, Ledger Quest. The other thing I would say is join communities of like-minded people, whatever that is for you. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a member of, you know, 90s kids, which is a bunch of skateboarders, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> and shit, I'm more of an 80s kid than a 90s kid, but, you know, at, at least, um, 
you know, it's a community of like-minded people. That one may or is probably not for you, but find one that is for you. Um, or I, I always recommend that, that people, you know, if, if you're interested in kind of the cultural or the artistic side of this, you know, look at, you know, collecting on a chain like Tezos. So, you know, join the discord of object.com, um, join the discord of FX hash and just lurk, you know, see what people are doing, see what people are talking about, see what people are buying, see what, you know, um, sparks your interest. I mean, you could, you could, you know, put $50 worth of Tezos to work over six months and, you know, actually, you know, not, not win or lose too much, but, become a member of a community, become, you know, familiar with, with artists and, and kind of get to know this world. I think that's, you know, a much better way to enter than, you know, taking a lot of risk, taking a lot of, um, you know, doing something that is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe doesn't, maybe not smart, but I think if you're, if you're in the, if you're in the space, um, and you're, you're watching what's going on, then you'll, you'll start to get a feel for it and you'll make friends. You'll, you'll be, you'll, you'll be a part of communities. And you'll, and I think in that way, you're, you're more a part of the future um, than somebody who is, you know, reading about bored apes in, in, you know, the wall street journal and then thinking they know what's going on. I promise you those people absolutely do not. Um, you know, you, you, you just, you know, you're, you're just sort of a part of this, like, uh, you know, surface level zeitgeist, as mm -hmm. opposed to being a part of a, of a community, which is, um, you know, which is really focused on something, um, that, that, you know, that that's deep niche, moving, active, liquid, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because sometimes it sounds so corny, but actually one of the takeaways from, from all of this is actually that you have to lean into like embracing yourself and having fun with it around it. And, you know, as we kind of get closer to to closing this out like i think it's really important like remind people who are listening like why actually is ownership uh and its relation to crypto so revolutionary right now what we're always doing is you're always building on the past right so we've we've been we've just been through a revolution of information which has onboarded um billions of people into networked lives we layered on top of that this pandemic you know, which not only, um, you know, had kind of these, these unprecedented economic stimuluses in, in the, you know, in, in the traditional world, but also pushed us into spending more and more time in digital worlds working, um, and, and learning, et cetera. You know, our kids went to, went to school on zoom, our, our meetings, you know, became much more comfortable, uh, you know, everyone of, of every age became much more comfortable uh, working with people who were not in the same physical space with them. I mean, even when I started work at Apple, they had almost zero culture. The people who invented FaceTime had zero culture of, um, of remote meetings, right? And now they've, they've spent years with not being, you know, in, the, in, their, in their new offices. Um, so, you know, we have, as humanity, learned um, to collaborate with people we are not in the same physical space with, which is, you know, for me, the actual definition of the word metaverse. The definition of the word metaverse does not contain the word 3D, um, but it, it is about people who are not in the same physical space together collaborating with, with, with one another. Okay, so that to me is why, you know, digital value is is so important. It's not because digital value alone is... Um, is important. It's because you're you're putting this this technological revolution of digital value on top of a networked society, right? And and you know and therefore you know you'll you'll get that build over the next fifteen years, just like we had, you know, with the internet, um, where things went from being, you know, um, exciting and overblown and dot com bubble mm -hmm. to um, more practical and realistic and, you know, built kind of one foot in front of the other. Uh, and then, you know, you get very real use cases. Again, for me, I think the best w thing to do is to assume that 15 years from now, your, your government document is a digital document. And the, and the way that you move borders is to prove you're the owner of the wallet that contains that document. If you just take that as, um, as, as an assumption and now work backward from there, you see all kinds of, of things that happen. You know, I love the, and if you want to take a less serious example, I love the example of concert tickets, mm -hmm. which, you know, when I was a kid, 
uh, you know, if my mom took me to see, you know, Kiss or ACDC, which she did, thank you, mom. You know, I would take those those tickets and, um, you know, put them on my cork board because like that was a big deal in my life, you know, to do that. Now, you know, through the internet, what did the internet give us? Uh, a, a shit ton of advertising. That's what. And so what have our concert tickets become? Another form of advertising. So you print out this, this concert ticket. You and I went with Tony last night to see The Cure. Mm-hmm. And what did we have? We had printed tickets um, that the top half was a ticket. The bottom half is an advertisement. Um, and, you know, and then I don't know about you, but I saved my backstage pass and I threw, my, tic- I threw my ticket in the garbage, right? A hundred percent. And, and, but in the future, you know, that ticket will be collectible again and there will be this, you know, and 20 years from now, you know, we will be like, yeah, remember that night we went with Tony to see the cure and here's the proof, you know, I, you know, and, and so I think that, I think these things are, are, are very, um, you know, it's, it's like, this is, you know, as Clayton Christensen says, or said, there are no new human problems. We just hire new technologies to solve old problems. So, you know, that putting my ticket on my cork board, you know, it had a, it had meaning for me as a kid. Imagine, you know, if today I had an NFT for every concert t-shirt I've ever owned. Imagine if I had an NFT for every skateboard I've ever owned. You know, they wouldn't all have the same value, but certainly that one that was the one that got, I got for Christmas at that age that changed my life, like that would have special meaning for me. And it's not even that it would have special value. This isn't about, you know, a bored ape going from, you know, from zero to $250,000 in value. That's not what this is about. That concert ticket on my cork board did not have resale value, but it had a lot of value to me personally because it's proof of life. It's proof that I existed. It's proof that I experienced. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, in these digital lives that, that we live, um, we, we, of course we will have our, they'll have their own economies. Of course they'll have their own collectibles. Of course they'll have their own products. Of course they'll have their own identification ways of, of showing that we're individuals, ways of sharing, right. Ways of, of, you know, combining one thing into another, like what Moonbirds is doing right now, you know, saying that if in addition to a moonbird, you have these other things in your wallet, your moonbird can now become something else. You know, these are, these are like, you know, very, very cool things. And like, they fit a lot of, you know, things that we've done, you know, previous in life. I mean, the way that, 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 you know, kids alter clothes and sell them on Depop, like this is, you know, this is, this is not, you know, um, it might be fringe behavior, but to the point from our very first part of our conversation, like, all behavior is fringe behavior, right? There is no such thing as everybody. There never was. You know, mass media made us believe that there was a left and a right, you know, um, for so long. And really what you had was a left and a right and a lot of unre- unrepresented voices. Um, and and so, you know, so now, you know, Discord in so many ways represents humanity, um, you know, way better than, you know, you know, NBC, ABC, and CBS ever did. Yeah, right? I mean, you're you're hitting on this exact piece, which is that emotions don't change, boundaries change. And in the mass scale of humanization, where we are these one of one, your individualism and actually having ownership over that is the most important choice you could make today. And so it's essential that as you do that, you educate yourself, you understand the change that's coming, you tell your friends around you, and you hopefully use Ledger Stacks as your gateway for this next era because there is no going backwards. And what is coming is actually incredibly exciting and actually validating for more human behavior as it is today versus the human behavior we project through, through outdated societal norms. Ian, thank you. I am so excited at everything we've been working on. You know, it's been going on much longer than I've been here, but today is a really special day with the launch of Stacks, with Ledger Stacks, and um, thank you for telling your story and why it matters. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, and, and really, Ari, thank you for everything that you do. We got to do one of these with uh, with you. I want to talk about, like, uh, you know, how somebody who has, you know, no, no background in, not no background, but is not a former CMO yeah. has come to be the head of communications and, and, and marketing at, at Ledger and how we do what we do. Because I think, honestly, I think, um, I think we're building something new, new and different here. Um, oh, you know, we're not, you. we're not building, uh, we're not, 
And like, like you and I always say, I don't want to build the future with the past. So, you know, but that's hard to do. We're trying to build something new. <laughs> well, until next time, Ian, um, thank you. Yeah, no, I'll thank talk you. to you later. All right. Talk to you in a bit. This content is provided for informational purposes only and is the sole expression of our opinion and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Do your own research. Any loss or profit is your sole responsibility. Stay safe.